I'll need to move in the uh, decoration uh, good to be here this morning. I'm here a while back before Christmas when we had pastor appreciation day. Bruce, do you remember when that was? It was in October. Before Christmas, yeah. Oh, that was right. Thank you. Um, I chose this song because it, it's about Brother Tommy because he's a good preacher. He's not only a preacher, he's a Sunday school guy, leader, preacher, Wednesday night service. He sends us texts most every day. And he's also a grandfather and a father. So is he busy or what? So I want to, uh, I said before, when he learns the scripts, I believe he's going to be a good preacher. Amen. Y'all believe that? I think Amen. it's about there already. Yeah. Uh, in the book of Isaiah, you'll hear this song concerning Brother Tommy. Also, uh, chapter 6, verse 8, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. I believe that talks about Brother Tommy quite a bit. Song of called. I need you to hear that today.
Amen. Take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. And <clears throat> just to let you know, if it weren't for Jesus, I'd be in jail or somewhere like that. You know, an awful place. I might even be in hell uh, this very day. So it's, a, it's the grace of God that we have life through His Son. And we thank the Lord for His... Uh, patience and mercy with us. Romans chapter 3, and I want to draw your attention to verse 9. And to be honest with you, it's hard to find a, a stopping point, but, uh, but I'm going to read for a, a, a little bit, and let's ask that God will get a hold of our hearts and speak to us this morning by the Holy Spirit. Romans 3, and begin reading verse 9. And I want to uh, share with you a thought this morning. Do you need a Savior? Of course, uh, those of us who are saved would say absolutely. Amen. It's not even a question. But I want to think about your own life and your own heart this morning. Romans 3, verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? And, and Paul's been comparing the Jew and Gentiles and he's saying, are, are the Jews better than the Gentiles? And this is his answer, no and no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin or in bondage to sin, enslaved to it. And then he says, this is what the Bible teaches. As it is written, there's none righteous. No, not one. Out of all of creation, not one. There's none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. God does the first work of grace in drawing us and speaking to us. If it weren't for Him, none of us would ever come. Amen. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good... Again, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher or grave. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips. They sure know how to hurt people. Not only hurt them, but destroy their lives. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. Notice verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. They think so little of God, they're not afraid of Him whatsoever. Now, we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is made manifest or is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. This is what God's told us all the way from the beginning. Uh, through the law, through the prophets. He told us about the coming of the Messiah that would save us from our sins. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a perpetuation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of Him which believeth in Jesus. And we'll stop our reading there. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank You for this morning and the service and... God, the opportunity that some are in this service have today to meet Jesus, to understand their uh, grave condition. And Lord, we realize that without the work of the Holy Spirit, 
There's nothing I could do or say that would wake them up or alarm them to their need of Christ. Lord, it takes you. You're the Savior. Only you can convince men that they need Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would do that this morning. We also ask you for uh, those believers that are a part of this service today that are really keeping you at arm's distance and not trying to draw near to you. Lord, speak to them again afresh and anew and stir their heart. Remind them of the great truths of the Word of God. Warm them, Lord, to renew their relationship with you and to come and kneel before Jesus today. Father, we just pray that you would accomplish your will in this service and that you would be glorified in it. Keep us from saying anything, Lord, that would distract from what you're trying to get across today in this message. But, Lord, help us say everything we need to to uplift the name of Jesus and draw sinners to Christ. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. I don't know how it is on job job applications now, but I know in the past when you filled out a job application years ago, like maybe like in 1942 when I was a young man, <clears throat> they used to have a question on there. Basically, they were trying to figure out how you viewed other people, and the question went along this line, uh, are most people basically good? I mean, remember filling out a question like that on the employment form. What they're trying to find out is, do you think that you can get along with other people? Or do you think everybody's just rotten to the core? Do you think other people are mostly good or bad? And as a Christian, you're sitting there thinking, well, according to the Bible, there's none good, no, not one. <laughs> We're all rotten sinners. If I write that down there, though, they might not hire me. So I know what they want. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to try to answer the way what they're, what they're trying to ask. But the truth is, all of us are rotten sinners. We've got a great problem. Uh, there is a God in heaven, and one day we're going to stand before him, and one of our great mistakes is that we don't stop and think about the holiness of God, how perfectly holy he is, and then we don't even stop and ponder, especially in our day, how awful and wicked that we really are. Right. In fact, we spend a lot of time trying to convince ourselves that we are all good people. If you try to talk to individuals about their need of Christ, one of their first uh, reasons for not coming to Christ is, I am a good person. <laughs> And what they're saying by that is that I don't murder, you know, I had never, you know, killed anyone. There's no bodies in my backyard. And I don't go around doing just wicked, terrible things. And so I'm not all that bad. And, and if I'm not all that bad, maybe I could go to heaven when I die. That's not the standard. And by the way, who are you comparing yourself with? If you go to the Bible, the Bible sheds some light on just how awful and sinful that we really are. And, and, I, and I do ask that the Holy Spirit of God would, would help you to see that. When you look at the current, our current society, it seems to be uh, unrailed. It's just going wild. Yes. Murder and all kind of mayhem is on the increase, but you don't have to look at our current society. Just look at history itself, and you'll see mankind is completely corrupt, evil, ungodly. In the beginning, when God made Adam and Eve, and they sinned against God, death passed upon all men with all of sin, simply meaning this, when we were born in this world, we were born with a nature that is extremely selfish. We don't care who gets hurt. We don't care what problems come up. All we really care about is ourselves. We don't care if we have to kill somebody for ourselves. I mean, whatever we have, we don't care if we have to use people, just as long as I get what I want. And that's, that, that, that's what's going wrong in the world today. We are ungodly, we're corrupt, we're evil. 
When God looked down upon his creation before the flood, he said, I, I, it grieved me that I made man because man's imagination, his thoughts, are only evil continuously. 24 hours a day, he's thinking about wickedness and sin and ungodliness and selfishness and horrible things. He is consumed with evil to the point that God destroyed that earth with a flood and said, let me start over again with just one family. Well, things haven't changed much in the last 4,000 years, have they? We have the same problems that Noah had in his day. We've got a world of people that really hate God and, and they don't want to do what God tells them to do. And they're, and they're doing their best to be their own God and it's causing problems multiplied upon problems. Yes. Paul says in verse 9 that it's not a matter of your religious background. Jew and Gentiles are basically the same. We're all sinners. We're all bent to be opposers of God, to do our own thing. And then he gives this long list, and we're not going to go through verses 9 through 18 and notice each and every verse, but I hope just to pull out some things to you this morning that might help you. First of all, I want to notice with you our rebellion. Yes, my God. Our rebellion. Verses 9 through 18 are basically saying that we are rebellious people. He's pulling quotes out of the Psalms and out of Isaiah, different parts. He's not just quoting one psalm. Paul's going back and picking out verses, a topical sermon that says, see here, see how wicked we are here, see how unrighteous we are here, see how selfish we are here, see how we have no fear of God. He said, that's the human heart. We are rebels at our core. And by the way, that's not a good thing. And some people boast in their rebellion, but when you rebel against God, you're playing the fool. One of those sections that he pulls from is Psalm 14. And if you know your Bible as well, you'll know Psalms 53 and Psalm 14 say the same thing, but they both begin with this, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, in our King James Bible, the word uh, said in his heart is italicized. It means it was not in there originally, but it's added so you can understand the sentence in the English. If you read it in the Greek or Hebrew, you wouldn't get that, but it's put in there. So the verse could say, the fool has said, no God, I don't want you telling me what to do. I don't want you telling me how to live. I don't want you demanding I go here or do this, I wear this or not wear this. I don't want you bothering me. No, God, I'll live my own way. That's what he's saying. It's a foolish man that says to his creator, I don't want nothing to do with you. No, God, if you were not a rebel against God, you would have already received his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'd be attempting to live according to his will. If you haven't received his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that only demonstrates the fact that God has given you a simple commandment, obey my son, believe on Christ. And you to this point have said, no thank you. I'll keep doing my own thing. I'll keep going my own way. I don't care what God said. Now if you'll think about that for a little bit, you'll see how insane that thinking is. And by the way, we all were there at one time. I was there as a young boy. I said, no God, I, I want to do this. I want to live this way. I can't live that way and live for you. I want to do these things. God said, Tommy, don't do those things. They'll destroy your life. I don't care if they destroy my life or not. I want to do them. And in doing that, I was playing the fool. God was trying to save me from a lot of heartache and horror and trouble. And I was determined before I met Christ to get involved in it as much as I could, which was insanity. 
To be a rebel against God is foolish. Christopher Hitchens wrote a book that said, God is not good. He's an atheist. He's passed away. He died of cancer. Sadly, he died of cancer. He passed away. He's in eternity now. But he wrote the book, God is not good. And he tried to convince all the readers that God was this, if he existed at all, it was this big, mean bully upstairs and said, you're going to do what I tell you to do and you're going to like it. By the way, if he's God, he has the right to say that. And that wouldn't be wrong at all if he's God. Amen? We certainly aren't God. We didn't make ourselves. Right? There is an eternal being that made us and we need to bend the knee before him and not continue to play the fool. How corrupt and how wicked and how evil and how ungodly must we be to continually say to God, no. I'm not interested. I don't care. You know what? That's what rebellion says that. Lord, you sent your son to die for me on the cross and he suffered a, a, a horrible death just to keep me out of the, the eternal flames of hell. And my response to that is, I don't care. And if you really could picture yourself, that would be like you spitting in the face of God. That's right. You think if I had given you something so precious and you treated it like trash, just threw it out, that it wouldn't wound my heart. How much you think the Father feels when we treat His loving gift of Christ such a great gift as if it was nothing. It has to be vile. It has to be wicked. It has to be evil. For us to treat him that way, there's no other definition for that, is it? Add insult to injury. We not only say no to God, but we embrace the devil. It's not just that we say, God, I'm not... No! Don't... don't. Don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me how to live. But we go over here and smooch up with the devil. Okay. We get on his team. We start fighting for his cause. You say, preacher, how in the world do we do that? Well, Jesus said, if you're not with me, you're against me. You say, well, listen, I'm my own person. I'll do, I don't, I'll do what I want to. I'm not going to hurt nobody else. It's just me. If I hurt myself, so what? That's a lie. That is a lie. You're not just hurting yourself. No. You're hurting everybody that knows you. Amen. When I first came to Christ, there was, I had six siblings, two, two brothers and four sisters. And when I started going to church, I immediately started praying for their salvation and my mom and dad's salvation too. And I didn't realize that my life would, would influence their life. I came to Christ, guess what? Because I came to Christ, it started influencing them to come, come to Christ. But if I had rejected Christ, guess what I would have encouraged them to continue to do? I would have encouraged them to continue to reject Christ. And some people are in hell right now because they had loved ones that pointed them in the wrong direction. It's not that you just fight against God and refuse to do His will. You embrace the wicked, evil, wretched devil and you fight for Him. It irritates me when people point their finger at God and they falsely accuse Him. Some tragic event happens. Some disease hits the family member, a little child, and people point the finger at God's face and say, Why are you doing that? And God said, I didn't do that. You did that. I told you not to. That wasn't my will. If, God, if man had obeyed God, there wouldn't be no disease. No one would ever die. No child would ever get sick. None of that would happen. Why is it here? Because we did what the devil wanted us to do. If you're going to blame anybody, put the blame in the right place. How dare you stick a finger in God's face and say it's his fault? When it's the devil's fault and our fault for agreeing with the devil. Amen. Think about this. All other creation gladly does God's will. 
The sun never says, I don't care. If you want me to shine today, I'm not going to shine. I'm just going to, I'll do my own thing today. You know what? It, every day it shines. Every day. Just like it was created to do. By the way, it shines all the time, not just in the day, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> to be a little bit more scientifically accurate, I guess. The moon, the stars, they never say, I'm going to get off course. I'm going to get closer to the earth. I, I think I'll just change things up a little bit. No, they say your will is the best. Your plan is the best. It functions perfectly the way it is. And I'll, I'll joyfully participate in glorifying you and doing my job. Yes. Glory Trees and flowers and seas bow to His will. Yes. Immediately. This morning in Sunday school, Jesus still in the bow of the boat said to the raging sea and the winds, Peace be still. And they just dropped to His knees. And they said, Your Lord... Your boss. We gladly do what you instruct us to do. Psalms 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of, the, of God and the firmament showeth His handiwork. The sun says, S-U-N says, You've been created by a great God. Love Him and serve Him. The moon echoes that. and says, Your God is wonderful, all-powerful. He's amazing. His plans are perfect. Obey Him. Love Him. Worship Him. All the trees and flowers of the earth, they sing the same chorus. Yes. It's only the evil heart of man that says, ah, I don't think I'll do that. Oh. Romans 1 verse 20 says this, For the invisible things of him that is of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead is divine nature, so that we are without excuse. You say, I don't know if there's a God or not. Open up your eyes. Listen, you can't close your eyes and say, I'm blind. Okay. If God would just show me something, oh, okay. I'd I believe it if He just showed me something. Well, open your eyes. Okay, right. You've got them shut. You refuse. To see. It's not that you can't see, it's that you don't want to see. I got into a debate with an atheist one time. He said, You need to prove that there's a God. We talked a little while about creation, and he got more angry and more agitated, more irritated, and finally I changed my argument. I said, Your very hatred proves there's a God. What? I said, your hatred. You spend all this time, you're angry, you're mad, and you hate, and you hate God. That, that hatred proves there's a God. How does that prove there's a God? I said, because if there wasn't no God, you wouldn't be mad at no God. That's right. I said, you spend all this time arguing people about Santa Claus? Yeah. I mean, you get online and spend hours and hours I know Santa's real. I mean, I've been in the North Pole. I hate scientists say there is a North Pole. So because there's a North Pole, we have chimneys, and there's presents on Christmas, there has to be a Santa Claus. It's got to be true. You don't do that because you know there ain't no Santa Claus. Right. But you do know there's a God, and that's why you argue and argue. You're not trying to convince me. You're trying to convince yourself. You're willfully ignorant. Because you're a rebel at heart. And you don't know how great that sin is to say no, no to God. Most people say, Preacher, I don't hate God. I'm not in active rebellion against God. Well, you tell me what's worse. You tell me what's worse. Somebody who is, doesn't get angry, angry and agitated about it, or somebody who just don't even care. They don't care one way. You tell me which one's worse. At least the one that's angry is kind of fighting in himself. The one that says, I don't care. How wicked do you have to be to not care? I, I submit to you, that's worse.
How can you treat God this way? You live on His green earth. You drink His good water. You soak in His sun, S-U-N. You feed your face with His plants and His provisions. You breathe in His breath, air, His fresh air every day. You breathe it in and out. You enjoy all the provisions of God. You enjoy all these provisions. And yet you refuse to bend the knee. How wicked is that? How ungodly is that? Men foolishly boast that they can live independent of God while they breathe His fresh air and eat His food and drink His water. You really want to live independent of God? Okay, stop breathing now. Just take it up on your own. I don't need God's oxygen. You wouldn't do that. You say, preacher, that's insane. Right. And yet you're trying to live your life without Him. A lot of people are like the church and lay able to see in Romans 13, or Revelation 3, 7. Revelation 3, 7. Remember the church at Laodicea said, I have need of nothing. But when God looked at them, He said, you don't understand. You're wretched, you're miserable, you're blind, you're naked, and you're poor. You say you don't have need of anything. You don't know how bad you need help. That's our rebellion. What about our record? In Revelation chapter 20, and by the way, you said, preach, I don't believe that. Can I say something to you? you don't, I don't care if you believe it or not. God does not lie. Yeah, right. When God said something, guess what? That's exactly what He's going to do. In Revelation chapter 20, about verse 11, it says there's a great white throne of judgment. And it says all the unsaved, the dead, the dead, spiritually, they've never been made alive in Christ, will stand before Jesus as He sits on the great white throne of judgment. And it says the books will be open. And you've got a long record there of constant sins against God. By the way, can I say something to you? Even when you were just an infant. Okay. You say, preacher, even when I was an infant, yes. Because as an infant, you were full, rotten, and you lied all the time. And we got records of it. You would scream and holler like something was just tragically wrong with you, and we'd go in there, and your diapers would be fine, and nothing poking your body, your, your, your stomach would be full, you didn't need no... And, and we'd pick you up, and you would stop crying immediately. You didn't care if we had not slept for hours or days. You just said, come pick me up. Something's wrong. We picked you up. Nothing was wrong. And you enjoyed getting by with it. But on that day, the record will be revealed. Let me say something to some here today. You said, Preacher, I'm, I'm not all that bad. I'm going to tell you, that, that list of your sins against God is a lot longer than what you think it is. Because you know there's some things that God has told you not to do, and you've done them. He told you not to lie. Anybody here, you've never told a lie in your entire life. Would you raise your hand? Anybody here? I'm, not, I'm going to ignore that hand. <laughs> you never told a lie here, Charlie. Because if you raise your hand, you just told a walker. <laughs> but on your list is a long list of sins. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul lists some things that people do that they'll not enter into the kingdom of of God. They won't go to heaven when they die. And he starts the list in verse 9 saying this, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? First of all, those who lack the righteousness of Christ. Your, your own righteousness is, is filthy rags. It's, it's disgusting garments that need to be dis, dis, uh, thrown away, discarded. That's your righteousness. And, but he goes on to say, but 
Be not deceived, neither fornicators. Listen, if you sleep with someone before you get married, that's fornication. And there are many other types of sexual sins. Right? And God said you can't practice that. You can't continue in that sin. If you do that, it's in rebellion to me. You can't claim to have a right relationship with me and then live in wickedness. It doesn't go together. Now you may fall into it, as a Christian, and you need to get repentance and say, Lord, I don't want to do that again, but it's not a practice that you live by continuously. But he said, neither idolaters, those that worship any other thing other than God. And we're not talking about just bending the knee before an idol either. You know you can love yourself. You can be an idol just loving yourself. You can love your even family too much if you love them more than you love God. Amen? And I'm not trying to make it harder than what it is. I'm just saying God has to have the supreme place in our lives. Nor adulterers, people that are married, and then they go outside that marriage and have sexual relations. God said, that's a sin. You can't practice adultery and go to heaven. Nor effeminate, that's homosexuals, or men uh, parading around as women, acting like women, dressing like women, looking like women, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, people that participate in sodomy, nor thieves, nor covetousness, nor drunkards, nor revilers, extortioners. You, you practice these things and said, you shall not inherit the king. Don't fool yourself. Live this way, you're not going to make it to heaven. Is that what he said or not? And then he says in the next verse, but such were. Some of you used to do this, but you no longer do it because you met Jesus. Amen? So on your record, what's there? Well, your words are there. Look at what Jesus said, Matthew 12, 36-37. But I say unto you that every idle word that a man shall speak they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by your words thou shalt be justified, and by your words thou shalt be condemned. He said, every idle word that you have ever spoken since birth until death, God said, that's going to be on the record. You know, I'm glad I've got a lot of those words expunged. <laughs> when the blood of Christ was applied to my account, he covered my sins. I'm glad a lot of those words were done away with. But it's a shame that even in our day, Christians are not concerned about what they say. Lying words, angry words, profane words. You know, you know, one of the things that you ought to want as a Christian is to speak, to speak cleanly when you speak to others. Yes. Yes. You know, we used to know this as Christians. Christians shouldn't go around cussing or saying inappropriate things. You know, there are some things that are not cuss words. They're just inappropriate. That you wouldn't say with uh, mixed couples. You know, years ago, when I was young, they wouldn't even use the word pregnancy. They wouldn't use that. We use it all the time now. They they say she's with child. They wouldn't say anything. They didn't want to get nowhere near the subject. And, and but we've gone so far that we we've taken a lot further than that. Even people that attempt to be kind of modern preachers, they will use profanity in the pulpit. Now listen, if it's a Bible word and we're reading a passage and God uses that word, that's an appropriate word. But you ought to be real careful about using your... The people When they hear you talk, they should know, this guy's clean. He's clean in his mind. He's clean in his heart. Words come out of his mouth. They're right words. They're appropriate. There's no profanity coming out of his mouth. Not only your words, but your works. I met a lady yesterday. She said, if I live this, this day of this year, I'll be 100 years old. Some people don't live that long. But 
most people spend the overwhelming majority of their life doing as they please. Can I say something even, even us Christians? You know, when Jesus was here, He spent His entire life doing only what the Father wanted Him to do. And that should be the goal of every single one of us every day to do only what Jesus wants me to do today. Amen? Don't lose sight of that goal. Proverbs 21 verse 4 says this, A high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. That, a high look is when you look down on others and you think you're better than them. And the truth, this is the truth. No matter how much money you have in the bank, there's not a soul in this world that's better than any other man or woman. Amen. Amen. It don't matter whatever your problem, whatever your difficulty, it doesn't matter. If you're a human being, <laughs> you are, you've got great value because you were created in the image of God. And then it says, not only a, a high look, but a proud heart. And I can get that, can't you? I mean, here, here God, God tells you to do something, and you say, well, I'll do what I want to do. He said, man, that's definitely sin. But here's a poor old fella out in the field, and he's got some donkeys tied to a plow, and he's sweating all day long, and he's worked really hard, and he's bone dead, tired at night, and he lays down, and God says, you've sinned all day. Well, how could all this hard work be sin? He said, because you're living for yourself. I did not create you to live for yourself. Amen. I created you to live for me. Yes. And all you're interested in is doing what you want. Mm. And you get wore out at doing that. But when it comes to doing what I want, you have no interest at all. He said, you work as hard as you want to, and it's still sin if you don't work for me. By the way, some people think work is a sin. It, but, I, you know, I, sadly, I have to clarify that. <laughs> it, it's not a sin to work. Okay? Uh, it's a good thing to work. If you don't work, you don't eat. That's what the Bible says. But think, so far, some of you, your entire life, all you've done is what you You've given no thought whatsoever to the God that created you. What does He want from me? He put me here for a reason. Is it just to stuff my face and have fun? No. Don't you think you ought to start trying to find out what that is? The first thing He wants is for you to come and receive His Son, for sure. Amen? So your words your works and your ways. Some of you are going to continue, God, I don't want this. Some of you will keep running from Him. Hating Him. Ignoring Him. I'm telling you, you need Jesus. If anybody in hell had the chance to swap places to you, it wouldn't take them half a second. Not a twinkling of an eye. They'd say, let me sit in that pew. And let me tell you what else they'd do. They'd say, preacher, I don't need you to preach till 12. I'm coming to the altar now. I've got one shot to get things right with God. <laughs> I'm hitting that altar. And you finish the sermon if you want to, or you can come pray with me. But I want Jesus. Because you're not there, though. And you keep listening to the devil, you don't think it's ever going to happen to you. That's a lot. what a lot of folks thought that, that, that's in hell right now. I don't want to see you make that mistake. Let's close by talking about our rescuer. You know what it means to be saved? I asked him at one time, I said, are you saved? He said, yeah, I've been saved. I said, well, tell me, when would you? He said, I was drowning one time. A guy jumped in. He, uh, he saved me, so I've been saved. Well, I... That's a good word picture because when you're drowning, you can't save yourself. And you need somebody that has some skill and knowledge about what they're doing to come out and risk their life to try to rescue you, right? But 
we're not talking about just your, your life being taken away. We're talking about you dying and spending eternity in hell. And there's only one who can rescue you from that. And his name is Jesus. Amen? Amen? Amen. You're never going to be saved by trying to be a better person. You look at people today and you think, well, I, well, you know, I'm never going to live that way. I'm never going to do those things. Can I say something to you? Without Jesus, listen to me, without Jesus, you could do worse than that. You may be worse than that. The only reason that I didn't go down that direction, that course, is because I met Jesus as a young man 16 years old and asked him to save me and he saved me. That's the only thing that kept me from going down a road of more destruction and more terrible mess. I don't know where I'd be if he hadn't saved me that night. He came after me. He spoke to my heart. He, he dealt with me about being saved and I'm glad I listened to Jesus. He rescued me from myself from my sins. He wants to do the same thing for you. Amen? Amen? And He's the only one that can. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but Jesus never sinned one time. And as a sinless sacrifice that died, was buried, and rose again, that means when you get on your knees or on your face and you say, Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins and I'm sorry for my rebellion. And I want you to save me. The living Christ can hear that prayer and can change your life. Yes. But only Jesus can do that. Amen? Amen? If you'll come this morning and ask Him to, He will. There's a passage in John that says, if we come to Him, He will in no wise cast us out. Isn't that good to know that? We come, guess what? He'll receive us. And we want you to come this morning. Put your faith in Christ. And don't put it off. The older you get, the harder it gets to be saved. The older you get. In fact, it's unusual. Brother Frank, you saved at 70, 71. That is miraculous. That hardly ever happens. Most people are saved before the age of 15. Then after that, it gets harder. And why? Because you get involved in more and more sinful stuff. And then your heart wants more and more sin. And before you know, you're imprisoned to it. You come to Jesus before you get trapped uh, in a stronger trap of the devil. Amen? Will you do that today? Let's stand for a word of prayer. Father, please help us.